Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Todd Clint's SharePoint Podcast number 279, recorded live Monday afternoon, February 1st, 2016. Uh, I'm your host, Todd Clint, and I'll be your uh, your guide for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Uh, just uh, talk about SharePoint, things like that. And while we're doing this, first, I'm going to check and make sure I'm using the right mic. I am good. Uh, while we're doing this, uh, you can have, you know, we all have multiple uh, browsers and multiple uh, monitors and stuff these days. So keep this tab open, your live streaming tab, or if you're driving around in your car, you know, your other phone, your tablet, whatever, and uh, keep this going to one of them. But then go over to SharePoint.Rackspace.com to see what crazy things that we at Rackspace are selling around SharePoint. We've got all kinds of SharePoint services and hosted SharePoint, things like that. And then go to rackspace.com slash Microsoft and find out what other Microsoft products we have because we've got all of them. We've got SQL goodness and Windows and Link and Exchange and Office 365 and Azure. Ugh, it's all good stuff. So go out to uh, rackspace.com slash Microsoft. And while you're out there, while you're blowing up the internet with all your browsers and all that kind of stuff, don't forget about toddclint.com. Little, little corner of the internet that I like to call my own, uh, toddclint.com slash blog is got all of my, my wonderful blog posts, all the stuff you need to know about the podcast and all that. You can go to toddclint.com slash netcast to view the, the stream in the browser, to view the chat room, all that kind of stuff. A little something for everybody out of toddclint.com. All right. So as we all know, for those of you who've been here for a while, the first group of uh, the, the netcast to the podcast is production notes. And the big deal this week is this is the very first one I've done at four o'clock in the afternoon. Now, this is something I've been threatening to do for probably a year and a half now is move from the evenings to the afternoon for the live stream, but never really was able to make it happen because of work things and all that. Finally got it working. This week is the very first one after uh, what do we figure nearly seven years of being in the evening. Now it's in the afternoon. Little, little odd for me. The timing wasn't off. I wasn't able to procrastinate on my notes as much as I have been enjoying in the past but it's all working out. Now, we moved from 8.30 p.m. to 4 p.m. for a few reasons, and let's just get there some conspiracy theories out there. Let's just put those to rest right now. One of them was that I moved it because I knew that Daniel Glenn couldn't be here at 4 o'clock Central. I don't want to say that I moved it for that reason. I just want to say that's a very fortunate, uh, you know, unintended consequence. So that, uh, you know, I didn't plan it that way, but sometimes everything just kind of falls together, and that's... uh, that's just very fortuitous. So that worked out. Another reason was that I moved the, the podcast this specific day so that I could go to the Iowa caucuses tonight. Tonight at seven o'clock. I don't know if you guys have heard anything about this. I don't know if it's been on the news where you're at or anything. We try, we try to keep it quiet. We're very low key people here in Iowa. But the Iowa caucuses are tonight, and that's at 7 o'clock, and that's going to go whoever knows how long. But that would have cut into prime podcast procrastination time and hurry up and figure out content for podcast time and then podcasting time. So there were some some conspiracy folks uh, that thought that's why I moved it. I did not move it for that, but I am going to go to the, the caucuses tonight. And actually, we'll talk a little bit about that later. But uh, that is that is another one of those unattended uh, positive things. So the real reason that I did this, though, was, number one, I want, I've been bringing guests in. I brought some guests in last uh, last year. And what I found was the evening times were kind of tough for the guests. I'm interviewing folks my age. We've got kids and things going on. Also for folks in Europe and even the Eastern United States, the time was kind of uh, kind of crappy. And I'm just not a big deal enough for people to stay up late to be on my podcast. So it was it was causing the problem. So part of the reason for me moving this four and a half hours earlier was to make it easier for some of the guests that I want to bring on. I've already started talking to some of those guests. It's already in the works. So that's uh, that's working out uh, pretty well. So this will be the time. The production will probably be the same. If you miss the live podcast, the live stream, shame on you. You're missing out on a great show. All your friends are talking about it. Um, but the production will, will probably still come out Thursday mornings about the same time, unless I can somehow find time to do it ahead of time. But all that's good. So this is the very first one that I'm doing uh, for that. I've got some folks in the chat room. Apparently, my demographic skews a little older than I thought. It was cutting into people's bedtimes, things like that. So I'm glad that uh, I don't want to rob anybody of their beauty sleep. Mark Chrisman was one of the people in the chat room. Uh, 
Mark, you need all the beauty sleep you can get. And so if this was cutting into your, your beauty sleep, I apologize. I apologize to your wife. I apologize to your daughter and your son. I apologize to all of them. It was, uh, it was just, just, it's just been too much, but let me know what, what you think about this. If the live stream time's working well and all that, uh, Okay, so on to the topic. So I didn't have this in the notes, but we'll talk about this first. Again, tonight is the Iowa caucuses. You're all sick to death of hearing about it. I know I'll give it just a little bit of time. The presidential election here in the United States is coming up in just a few months now, right? Uh, eight months from now. And Iowa's got the first in the nation caucuses. I only bring this up because I've already had one podcast listener, Joanne Klein. She's a good friend of mine. She hails from... Western Canada. And she sent me an email or a tweet, I forget how it started last week and said, I'm hearing about all this crazy political stuff in the US. I don't completely understand all of the things that are going on. Would you answer a few questions? And I was like, absolutely. So then Joanne sends me this email. It's like 14 questions. It's like a page and a half. Um, so I had to go eat and, uh, you know, get hydrated and stuff. Uh, but I but I answered a bunch of her questions about that. So the reason I bring that up is because for people outside of Iowa, you probably don't understand how the caucuses work or what the big deal is or anything like that. And for those of you outside of the U.S., you probably don't understand how this whole garbled mess works. By all means, feel free to ask me any questions. Turns out my uh, desire for sharing knowledge isn't uh, confined to SharePoint. So I answered a bunch of Joanne's questions. She seemed mostly uh, well-educated. She did say that she was comparing the answers she got from me to what she'd learned watching the West Wing, and it mostly uh, worked out together. So, you know, if me and Martin Sheen are uh, on the same page about that, probably uh, probably not a bad deal. So that was fun. Uh, but the caucuses were tight. That's just how that uh, how it worked out. Vlad uh, Katranescu in the chat room, also in Canada, and he's talking about one of the crazy differences between the Canadian and the U.S. political the presidential race. In Canada, it was 78 days. Here in Iowa, since we've got the first the first contest and the first caucus, it's been going on here for the last year. And again, the election is eight months away. So we, we have a little more uh, of that to enjoy or however. Also, uh, because the caucus, the, the political folks can't pester you at home after 6.30 p.m., which is in, you know, two and a half hours here, they've been calling relentlessly. So if my phone goes off during this podcast, I, uh, <laughs> I apologize in advance. Um, so... That'll, so anyway, that's the, the only, anyway, if you got questions at Todd Clint, email me Todd at .com. Just curious to help people out. That's, uh, that's uh, fun stuff. Okay. So for technology stuff, it's been a big week. And the other thing, as, as I've moved this podcast to four thirty the other or four o'clock, the other thing that I'm trying to do is, and I've been doing this for a while, try to keep it to 30 minutes ish. Uh, cause that's a good consumable time. I started noticing as I was consuming my podcast, as I would bring one up, if it was like an hour or hour and a half, or sometimes even like 50 minutes, I just wouldn't listen to it. And then I realized that people were probably doing that to mine too. So trying to keep them down to half an hour. Uh, but this week I got a bunch of stuff. We'll see how lucky I am at that. The first thing that I wanted to talk about is Microsoft released last week a little teaser about the Azure Stack technical preview, and now it's actually uh, available for download. And this is a big thing. I work at a hosting company. I work at Rackspace, and this is a very big thing. And I, I wanted to give some time to talk about that a little bit. So what is the Azure Stack? The Azure Stack is essentially Azure in your data center. It's essentially a way to build out the Azure functionality, but on your hardware in your data center. So we are all sick to tears about hearing about the cloud, whatever the cloud is. One of the things that I really liked about this download for the Azure Stack technical preview is they've got a, a 10 page kind of white paper. And one of the first things that they say is that cloud is a paradigm, not a place. And so they get, they get kudos, they get a thumbs up for giving a, a better definition of cloud because when cloud first came out, it was all about having your things in other people's data centers. But Rackspace has been hosting for like 15 years. So was hosted email, cloud email? That seems kind of weak. That wasn't really what cloud seemed to be about. So good on Microsoft for saying cloud is not a place. Cloud is a paradigm. Cloud is a way of quickly creating resources for customers, you know, being able to quickly spin up websites, quickly spin up uh, virtual machines on shared hardware, having a good interface for the cloud customers to use, the good way for the cloud uh, runner, you know, the, the infrastructure folks to keep that going. 
So I really appreciated their kind of redefining and better defining cloud. I like that. They get negative 10 though for using the word paradigm. Uh, so I've been doing this, you know, having a job thing and been in the working world for, you know, a good 20 years now. And I remember back in the late nineties, early two thousands, everything was a paradigm, this or that, a paradigm shift, changing paradigm. So I kind of, kind of lost my luster on the word paradigm. I get what they're saying though. Cloud is a paradigm. It's not a place. And I think that's a good idea for all of us to think about. So now we've got this idea of private clouds and public clouds and, and all of that. So why would you want to run the Azure stack inside of your data center? The whole idea we've been hearing about hosting in the cloud and all that is to get that stuff out of your data center and let somebody else mess with it. This white paper does a good job talking about it. And essentially it's the paradigm thing. And it's things like our friends in Canada have some very fierce data sovereignty laws. Our friends in Germany have some very uh, hard data sovereignty laws as well, but they, they should be able to enjoy the, the, the management of cloud things, the management of Azure as well. And so that's what the Azure stack does. One of the great things about the Azure stack though, is it uses the same APIs as public Azure. So whatever you write, any orchestration bits you write or anything that will work against public Azure will work against the Azure stack. Um, so that will let you move things. And honestly, I think that's probably for Microsoft's benefit also, so that any tools that you make that work on Azure stack will work uh, in public Azure too. Um, but that is an interesting thing. I learned a word a while back called a retro NIM. And a retro NIM is a word that you use to describe something when its original uh, definition isn't good enough anymore. So the great example that the, the, the place where I heard the retro NIM talked about the acoustic guitar. A hundred years ago, they didn't call the, they didn't have acoustic guitars. They had guitars. That's just what it was. Cowboys sitting around the campfire didn't tell each other to, you know, go get the acoustic guitar, Jed. Let's, uh, let's get along little doggies and all that. They just called it a guitar. And then the electric guitar came out, you know, thanks to Les Paul and those guys. And so now guitar wasn't specific enough because it could be an electric guitar or one of these other guitars that's not electric. So the term acoustic guitar is a retronym for the thing that used to be a guitar. I bring that up not to look incredibly smart, though I'm positive that's how that came out. But because now I find myself needing to come up with a retronym for Azure because we've got Azure stack now. And so I find myself referring to the thing that used to be called Azure now is public Azure, so I can differentiate between the two. So if I say public Azure, I just mean Microsoft's public Azure. Um, so the reason I bring that up, the APIs are the same and the services will be the same or there'll be a subset of the same. So right now with the Azure Pack technical preview, there's just a handful of services in there. Public Azure has 50 some different services, so they're kind of short, but by GA, Azure Stack is hoping to have even more. Here's a short list. Here's the ones, <laughs> the ones, the services that I cared about. VMs, so run on virtual machines, uh, blob storage, table storage, virtual networking, load balancing, the VPN gateway, uh, the Azure portal, you know, getting in so the customers can get in and do things, uh, websites, uh, and, and a few more. So the great thing about all this is that this is a framework and they'll be able to add more of these services into Azure Stack as they get things figured out. Now they were pretty clear that a lot of the features inside of public Azure require other things. And so not everything will come over to Azure Stack. And I, and I understand that kind of like how SharePoint 2016 will probably never have an on-prem version of Delve or Office Graph because there's, there's other things out there. Um, the other great thing about that white paper is they kind of talk about scaling and what the, the philosophies behind Azure were. And they mentioned that when public Azure grows, when you know a, a place is uh, you know, getting full to capacity, the way they scale, scale is by, a, a, by 20 server racks. So when an Azure, a you know, public Azure uh, data center is running low on whatever the resource is, the smallest resource they drop in is a 20 server rack. So 20, I assume 42 U's, uh, all that of, of servicey goodness. Um, that was kind of interesting. So they, they talked about how as they were retooling the Azure pack, they had to scale down some of that because your average data, corporate data center is not going to be able to grow by 20 uh, racks at a time. So all very, uh, all very interesting stuff. The, the, so there's installation instructions there. So you can download this white paper. You can actually download the, the scripts that build this thing out. It requires Windows Server 2016 and that, you know, a, 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 a non-domain joined 
Windows Server 2016. It also requires Azure AD. And so when you, when you build this out, you're gonna hook it up to an Azure AD account, and that is how Azure Stack is gonna work with an Azure AD thing. The good news about that is Azure AD is free, at least the, uh, the non-premium version is, the basic is, so that doesn't, doesn't cost you anything. The hardware specs were kind of fun. I work for a hosting company, so I don't run a lot of servers at home anymore. And so I've kind of fallen out of what that looks like. But the server that you will run the Azure Stack on, the minimum hardware requirements are a dual socket, 12 physical core box, but they prefer you have 16 physical cores, that's recommended. A minimum of 96 gigabytes of RAM, but recommended is uh, is 128. <laughs> I wrote 126 in my notes. I don't think it's 126. I'm pretty sure it's 128. Um, it requires a 200 gig C drive, a 200 gig OS drive, and then a minimum of four drives with a minimum of 140 gig of storage apiece, but they recommend 250 gig drives. And that, I mean, so it makes sense, right? You've got like, uh, you know, Azure in a box or data center a box is going to take some hardware. That just seemed uh, like some tough hardware. So I don't know if I'll be playing with, with Azure Stack or not. I physically don't have a machine that can come anywhere near running that here at home. But it's, it's great functionality. I like where they're going. I like this idea that the clouds are starting to meet and you'll be able to move things around. It's... Uh, it's it's good stuff, and I'm very excited about the technology. I've been watching it, you know, develop over the last couple of years. Very fun stuff. If any of you do end up using the Azure stack, I would love to hear hear what your you know what your thoughts on it are. You know, easy to set up, tough to set up. Something you're going to use, something you're not going to use. Um, all good. All right. The next fun thing that came out last week was your friend and mine, Cortana has added some new functionality. Now, one of uh, the things that Cortana will do is she will go through your email and look for places where you've promised to do things for people, like I'll get that chart to you by the end of day, or I'll make my flights by next Tuesday, whatever that is, and she will remind you before that time passes to do the thing you said you were gonna do in your email. I love that. So this is for, the thing I read had it for Windows 10. I don't know if it's on Windows Phone or not. Um, you need to be on the Windows Insider thing, so get in on that. There's, you know, the new, the new builds that come out. And then that functionality will be added. So this seems kind of scary. This seems kind of creepy. I've never really gotten into that creepy thing for this. So one of the things that first came up with this was when, I think it was Google, for Gmail, started having targeted advertising in the Gmail web UI. And people are like, oh, Google's reading my email. Blah. Google's not reading your email. Google doesn't give a pinch of anything what's in your email. Google has a process. Google has software that's going through looking for keywords. And for a while, it was big fun to show you know screenshots of people getting the wrong thing targeted to them because Google get tripped up over uh, homophones, things like that. It's not a person. There's no person reading your email and suggesting ads to you. And what I liked at the time when I saw that is people were likening it to antivirus software. It's no different. There's a process that runs your email looking for things. If it finds a thing, it kicks off another process. It's not really a violation of security. I see this as sort of the same way. And again, it's all voluntary. You don't have to use Cortana. You don't have to give her access to your email. But it's not like Microsoft is sifting through your email looking for things. It's a process, it's software, it's an algorithm. I don't think of it as a big deal. It's a little weird at first, but once you think about it as just being software, not, uh, not such a big deal. I actually am not running Windows 10 on my main work machine here, so I'm, I haven't been enjoying Cortana that way, but I'm getting close. Uh, Windows 10 has a couple of rough edges, and that's been the thing that's kept me from upgrading. I use multiple monitors, and I know that's one of the things that it gets a little rough on. We're getting close, though. I think I need to switch. All of my other machines are running Windows 10. All of my tablets, and that's saying a lot, right? <clears throat> All of my tablets, my work machine over here is running Windows 10. I've just got one machine left that's not. And uh, we're getting close. We should probably uh, probably get that one upgraded. Speaking of upgrades, last week Microsoft mentioned, or maybe two weeks ago, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, they added a new 
uh, some new SKUs, some new versions of the Surface Book and Surface Pro 4. And they added SKUs with one terabyte of storage. And this is fun. The Surface Book and the Surface 4 both, when they came out last year at the, that hardware event, it was a big deal. The hardware looked amazing, just absolutely amazing. And they, they, they said at the time, you know, what, what the specs were going to be. One of them that they said they were going to come out with was one with one terabyte of, uh, of drive space. And that has finally happened. That came out on the 22nd. Now, obviously, uh, a tablet or a, you know, tablet thinger like the Surface Book with a one terabyte drive is going to be expensive. The, the one terabyte Surface Book has obviously one terabyte of storage, a core i7 processor, 16 gig of RAM, and you can have it for the low, low price of $3,199. Yeah, $3,200, all yours for the service book. Got that fancy spring and that weird hinge that doesn't completely close. Um, $3,200, and that is all yours. Now, if $3,200 is a little steep for you, I don't I don't hold that against you at all. You can get the one terabyte version of the Surface Pro 4 for a mere $2,699 or uh, $2,700. So a little something in there for everybody, for the big spenders, and the, there's the budget model there for $2,700. I have not moved up to either of those pieces of hardware yet, I ran a Surface Pro 2 as my daily driver for a year, a year and a half. It was super convenient to have that thing here hooked up to all my monitors and all my hardware. And then when I travel, I would just take it with me and go and everything was there. But there started to be issues with that system. Number one, the Surface Pro 2, the most it could have is eight gigabytes of RAM. And that just wasn't enough. With having a couple of browser windows open, you know, Chrome and Internet Explorer and all that kind of stuff, eight gig of RAM just didn't didn't cut it all the time. And this podcast, for instance, doing the video and all that, it wasn't very good at that either. So I still had to have another machine for the podcast thing. The other thing is when I traveled, when I traveled with the Service Pro 2, again, it had a 10 inch screen. It was just too small, great on airplanes, crappy in hotel rooms when I'm on the desk and all I've got is a little. So I ended up taking a regular, like a 15 inch laptop a lot just to have you know, something I could look at when I was uh, in the hotel room. So I abandoned that. And that's kind of the reason I haven't gotten one of these other devices yet, because they are fairly expensive. And I don't know exactly where they'd fit. Like the Surface Pro 2 still is a decent traveling machine, still works great on planes and all that. Uh, but I'm getting close. I would like to, uh, I would like to do that. We'll see. But if you get one of those, let me know. The Surface Pro book has had a bunch of negative stuff. And Paul Thorat had an article, I wish I had the link here in front of me, last week about some of the ongoing problems with the service book and how Microsoft hasn't said anything about it, hasn't addressed it, hasn't acknowledged that they're there, and how that's getting very frustrating for the service book. People who've spent all this money spent $3,000 on this device and it, you know, it won't go to sleep and they, they end up you know hibernating and putting it in their backpack and then uh, they pull it out and it's, it's hot to the touch and it's got no battery left, things like that. Um, so not the time for me to jump on it yet, but I'm curious, uh, if any of you guys have, so I do want to talk about some SharePoint since I've got y'all here, um, with that. Uh, yep. So Vlad uh, quoted or put a link in the chat room. Welcome to surface gate. Paul putting gate at the end of things is just lazy, but yes, uh, that's the one that I was talking about. Vlad, thank you. Um, Last week, Brian LaLancette was on and we were talking about how the SharePoint 2016 release candidate was out and how it was an upgrade from beta 2 and that Brian was going to have a blog post on how to install directly to the release candidate. He has released that blog post. It'll be in the show notes here uh, if you're listening to the audio version and it's on blogs.technet.com slash <laughs> blogs.technet.microsoft.com slash Brian LaLa, Brian L-A-L-A. -L -A. And he talks about how you can take that patch, that the release candidate patch, drop it in the updates folder of your beta two installation, and it all gets installed um, right away. And I'm gonna be playing with that a little bit. Last week was kind of busy. I haven't had a chance to go through all that. I'll probably be putting something of that uh, about that on my own here. Uh, but that's good stuff. And again, like I said last week, that bodes well for how patching is going to look once SharePoint 2016 actually comes out in RTMs. They've really been focusing a lot on the patching, and that's that's good stuff. I like to see that. Okay, the last couple of minutes here. Again, trying real hard to keep this at 30 minutes or fewer. One of my second loves 
I have many Microsoft loves. I have SharePoint. I have Azure and Azure Active Directory, Office 365, SQL, Bob. <clears throat> Got to put Bob in any list of Microsoft products. Windows Phone, though that relationships, uh, I just don't know what to think of that anymore. Um, but one of my other loves is PowerShell. I've been, I use PowerShell every single day, multiple times a day. Love it. Always find fun things to do in PowerShell. And one of the yes, <laughs> yes I, Vlad reminded me Yammer. <laughs> everybody's favorite Microsoft product, Yammer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Can't believe I missed that one. That will be the butt of the new, the new jokes. Bob is out. Yammer is in. That'll make a great title for the episode too. But one of the other uh, platforms that I really love is PowerShell. And I've been following and doing a lot of things with PowerShell. And this last week, I guess, or two weeks ago, Microsoft released that they are decoupling the PowerShell integrated scripting environment from PowerShell itself. And they've got a, a release or a preview out there of the new PowerShell ISE. Again, a separate download. So it is no longer coupled with the releases of PowerShell or the release of Windows itself. And they've added some new functionality to it. And I, I like where this is going. And it's funny watching this over however many years, watching this kind of thing uh, collapse and expand and all that. You know, first off, we're going to release everything at once. And that's great because you can do it all at once. But then one product's a little behind and it doesn't work. And then you have to expand it out and break things up. And so this is, this is good that the ISE is broken up. Mark Chrisman is asking about word wrap. Word wrap is already in Windows 10. So what Mark's talking about is if you have a PowerShell one-liner that works some crazy magic and it, it takes multiple lines inside of your console, when you highlight it, the console highlights it as a block of text so you can't just paste it in someplace else. In Windows 10, if you open up your PowerShell window and go to the properties, there's a tab in there somewhere that says enable uh, smart console or word wrap or something. And it works exactly the way that we wanted it to work for the last 12 to 14 years. So that's in there. Um, one of the thing, so th some of the new, well, I guess <laughs> I got all excited about word wrap, lost my place. <clears throat> right now, the new ISE only works with PowerShell V5. So that means you need to be running Windows 10 or you need to have the Windows Management Framework 5.0 to install all this. And it will run side by side with the existing ISE so you're not losing any functionality when you, uh, when you tried that out. They've also got a user voice out there. Uh, so give that a shot and see if that, uh, you know, if that works for you and then give them some feedback and let them know what they like. This is going to be a constantly evolving thing. Uh, I like that they're doing this too. And again, the PowerShell community, great group. PowerShell is great. If you do SharePoint, if you do Office 365, if you do Azure, you have to be pr proficient in PowerShell. This is one of the great tools that will help you perfect your, uh, your PowerShell ninjury. All right, last thing that I wanted to talk about, and this is a, uh, <laughs> a somewhat technical thing. The company, uh, so I live in, in Ames, Iowa. We talked about this earlier that I'm in Iowa, doing the Iowa caucuses. The CEO for the company that my wife works for wrote an article for fastcompany.com today, and it's called Lessons I Learned, Why I Based My Tech Company in the Middle of Iowa. And... I liked it. Obviously, I'm a little biased because Matt wrote it and I know Matt, but it, it was sort of vindication for all of us who work in the Midwest and do technical things. Don't get up at the crack of dawn and milk cows before we go to work, things like that. But it was his reasons for when they started their new company back in 2008, 2009 that they did it in Ames, Iowa. And it's a long article. I'm not going to steal all of Matt's thunder, but Part of the reason that it's valid now and, and part of the reason we re need, need to rethink this idea of where tech companies are at is, you know, telecommuting is ubiquitous these days. Everybody does video meetings, all that. And not, not only is it actually a real thing now, it's commonplace. At Rackspace, every meeting is a video meeting unless otherwise stated. I don't get on phone bridges ever. Very, very rarely. Once every couple, three weeks maybe. But I have multiple meetings all day long and Every meeting I do is on video, every one of them. It's not the same as being in person, but it's a much better situation than, you know, on the phone lines and the, and the audio quality is terrible and you're doing something else. You're playing ping pong with your dog or something instead of paying attention to the meeting. Video meetings are a thing now. Bandwidth can handle it. Computers can handle it. And it makes remote employees, it makes it easier for them to do their job. 
Another thing about having tech companies outside of the coasts, outside of San Francisco and New York, is there's a lot of really smart folks out there that don't want to move. And I'm speaking, you know, not just myself, but um, universities, Iowa State universities here in town. There's, you know, 30,000 college students in this town with engineering degrees and that kind of stuff. They, they need work too, and it's great for getting interns. It's great for getting kids out of college and all that. And part of that, but the third piece is it's just, um, it's just cheaper. It's just uh, a lot cheaper to live in Iowa and hire in Iowa and have facilities in Iowa and all that kind of thing. And, and since there are ways to do it now and, and keep the business working, that's a great example. So, you know, uh, in his article, Matt talks about how the headquarters here in Ames has a lot of amenities that they would just never be able to afford if they had to have that same office space in San Francisco or New York City or something like that. And it was a really great piece. I liked it. He put a lot of thought into it. And so I thought I would uh, I would share that uh, with you guys. And in the chat room, it's fun talking about that. So, so Lori talks about how she doesn't do video meetings at all unless she's doing it with, with someone like us. Jason Himmelstein, a coworker of mine, a racker, uh, we're on the other end of the thing. He's like, we often do video meetings with people sitting 30 feet away. I have no exact, I, I'm not exaggerating even a little bit. It is not uncommon for me to be in a video conference with two people or more um, at Rackspace and they will be sitting back to back. Like I will be looking at one, one person's video and seeing the other person in that video and like seeing the video conference over their shoulder. That is how much we use video conferencing uh, at Rackspace. Yes, the two of them could have gotten up and walked over to a conference room, uh, but uh, but nope, <laughs> right back and forth. And, and it's funny you, when you get it, like somebody will be talking and you'll see somebody walk by in the background and then a couple of frames later, they'll walk by in somebody else's background we video conference everything around here and it's, it's good. Again, not as great as being in person, but it really helps out the camaraderie and all that. So I was glad to see that, uh, see that piece. Thanks to Matt for, uh, for writing that. All right. So we got promotion, shameless self-promotion. The time when I talk about how you and I might be in the same place at the same time. So here in a couple of weeks, three weeks from today, we've got SP TechCon, and that is in Austin, Texas, the 21st through 24th of February. You can find out about all about that at sptechcon.com. I think there's probably still time to register and things like that there. I'll be doing a couple of sessions. I think I'm doing upgrade. And I don't remember what else I'm doing. I keep meaning to put that in my notes and I keep forgetting. And then I copy from one week for the next and it's just never there. But uh, I'll be at SP TechCon. I'm going to have to leave early because I've got an event in San Antonio that same week. And I would, uh, I would love to meet you. So if you are going to be at SP TechCon, find me early. Find me on Monday or whatever. And uh, find me, shake my hand, introduce yourself. I would love to meet you. Anybody who's met me before can can corroborate this. I'm a really friendly guy. I love to chat with people. So if you're going to be at SP TechCon, find me early and uh, introduce yourself. And then a couple of months after that, I'll be at Dev Intersection. That event is April 16th through the 22nd in Orlando. I think I'm going to be there like the 18th, 19th, 20th, something like that, doing uh, doing my, my session there. If you're going to go to Dev Intersection, my request for you is that you go to my blog. And I've got a, a blog post there that talks about being at Dev Intersection. And there's a registration link in there. It's the regular registration link that everybody else uses. But go in there, and when you sign in there, use the promo code CLINT, K-L-I-N-D-T. That does a few things for you. That knocks 50 bucks off the cost of the conference for you. Um, I think it puts 50 bucks in my pocket, but I, I can't remember for sure. But th neither of those are the important thing. The most important thing is it's just a good old-fashioned popularity contest. It's like high school all over again, except I'm not watching it through the slats in my, my locker because I've been stuffed in there. Um, and so really what I want is I want a bunch of you guys to sign up using the promo code CLINT so that I can hang that over the heads of less cool, less popular people like Jason Himmelstein. So uh, do me a favor. Everybody wins if we crush Jason's spirit. Everybody wins. So if you're going to sign up for Dev Intersection, go out to toddclint.com slash blog, find my blog post on it, and register there using the promo code CLINT. Or you can go to devintersection.com, register there, promo code CLINT, and uh, we'll take it from there. So thanks, everybody. Good showing in the chat room um, <laughs> tonight or this afternoon. I'm going to leave the chat room open for a bit so you guys don't go anywhere. The live stream, I'm going to leave that running for a little bit. 
but uh, but not for too long. So again, if you'd like to join this mess live, it's at 4 p.m. Central Time U.S. And you can go to youtube.com slash Todd Clint Netcast. Sign up there. You'll get alerts when I go on air. You can go to toddclint.com slash netcast and find out all the details, find the chat room uh, and all those kind of things. Thanks, everybody. This first time has been great. The chat room has been good. Again, I'll stick around, chat with you guys for a bit. Thanks, everybody, and I'll see you next week.